Now, hemoglobin A1c is one of the most important parameters that is used in the monitoring and the control of diabetes. Yet few patients know exactly what the hemoglobin A1c is and what the importance of the hemoglobin A1c is and what precautions should be taken while measuring the hemoglobin A1c. This video examines those topics. A male patient in his mid-60s who had been diagnosed with diabetes 30 years before was treated with diet for the past 20 years and his hemoglobin A1c was hovering around 6.5. He went to see his clinician who prescribed glucotrol 5 milligrams for him. Over the next year, he suffered repeated bouts of hypoglycemia and his hemoglobin A1c slowly crept up from around 6.3 to 6.7. The clinician, realizing that any further elevation in his hemoglobin A1c would put the man at risk for complications of diabetes, referred him to a diabetic specialist for adjustment of his medication. How did the specialist handle this particular case? We shall see at the end of the video. Now, Samuel Raybar, who was a Persian doctor who was also a scientist, was in his lab in 1968 experimenting with variants of hemoglobin, abnormal hemoglobin, when he discovered a particular type of hemoglobin that was only found in the blood of patients with diabetes. That same year, it was shown that this abnormal hemoglobin was actually a molecule of hemoglobin that had bound to glucose in the red blood cell. This glucose-bound hemoglobin molecule was given a number of different names, including glycated hemoglobin, glycohemoglobin, hemoglobin A1c, and simply A1c. Now, the hemoglobin is a molecule that sits in the red blood cell that transports oxygen from the lung to the tissues. And when the blood glucose rises above a certain level, the glucose is able to penetrate the membrane of the red blood cell and bind to the hemoglobin molecule. The longer the blood cell is exposed to elevated levels of blood glucose, and the higher the levels of the blood glucose, the more hemoglobin becomes bound to glucose. This means that the level of the hemoglobin A1c in patients with diabetes is dependent on the duration of exposure of the red blood cell to elevated levels of blood glucose, as well as to the level of glucose that exists in the blood for a specific period of time. Now, because the red blood cell has a lifespan of approximately 120 days, it means that measurement of the hemoglobin A1c is a reflection of blood glucose control over the three months prior to the time the test was done. Initially, the discovery of hemoglobin A1c was not viewed with much interest by the scientific community. But as we well know, today, the hemoglobin A1c is one of the most important parameters that are used in the monitoring of long-term diabetes control. Up until that point, doctors were only able to get a snapshot of the blood sugar in patients with diabetes, but now they could look back into the past and get a sense of the average blood glucose levels that existed for three months prior to the time the test was performed. Then in the 1990s, the DCCT, the Diabetes Control and Complications Trial, and the UK PDS trial, the United Kingdom Prospective Diabetes Study, both showed that maintaining the blood sugar and controlling blood glucose levels to levels close to non-diabetic levels resulted in an almost 76% decrease in the number of complications that are specific to diabetes. Now, the level of hemoglobin A1c is dependent on the lifespan of the red blood cell, so that anything that shortens the lifespan of the red blood cell will lower the level of hemoglobin A1c measured in the blood of a diabetic patient. And vice versa, 
anything that extends the lifespan of a red blood cell would produce a falsely elevated hemoglobin A1c. For example, in patients who are exposed to high altitudes or in patients with hemolytic anemia or patients with chronic hemorrhage, uh, occult bleeding, these patients have shortened lifespans of their red blood cells and therefore hemoglobin A1c values that are measured in patients with these conditions are falsely lower than they should be. On the other hand, patients with iron deficiency, such as patients with iron deficiency anemia or patients with anemias caused by infection or anemias caused by tumors have extended lifespans for their red blood cells and therefore their hemoglobin A1c readings are falsely elevated. This sometimes forces clinicians to use alternative methods, alternative molecules to measure long-term blood glucose control. For example, they can use fructosamine levels or they can use glycated albumin levels. Aside from these factors that can alter the hemoglobin A1c readings, abnormal hemoglobins also can affect the reading of the hemoglobin A1c in diabetic patients with, say for instance, sickle cell disease or diabetic patients with thalassemia. That means that if you're a patient with one of these conditions, an abnormal hemoglobin, then it is important for your physician to check with the lab to make sure that the test that is being used is not one that is affected by these hemoglobins. The American Diabetes Association recommends that hemoglobin A1c should be measured at least twice per year in patients with well-controlled diabetes or at least every three months in patients who have recently had their medications changed or who have poorly controlled diabetes and that should be monitored more frequently. The recommended target hemoglobin A1c level for patients with diabetes is 7% or below. Hemoglobin A1c can also be used to diagnose diabetes and prediabetes. Any patient with a hemoglobin A1c level of 5.7 to 6.4 percent would be considered pre-diabetic and any patient with a hemoglobin A1c greater than 6.5 percent would be diagnosed as diabetic. Our patient described at the beginning of the video was suffering from bouts of hypoglycemia while fasting. However, his postprandial glucose levels, that is the glucose levels after he ate around one to two hours after eating were very elevated and this was leading to the slow but steady rise in his hemoglobin a1c despite the fact that he was having hypoglycemia his postprandial sugars were still leading to elevation of his hemoglobin a1c the specialist stopped the glucotrol and instead prescribed a low dose of gliburide 1.25 milligrams one hour before the two largest meals of the day. This meant that the level of the medication was peaking at about the same time glucose was peaking in his blood after his meal. These methods of intervention were successful. The patient's hypoglycemic episodes ceased and his hemoglobin A1c level came down to 6% which he was able to maintain thereafter. I hope this video gave you some insight into the hemoglobin A1c and hemoglobin A1c and measurement of hemoglobin A1c and the complications of measurement of hemoglobin A1c. The precautions that need to be taken have been elucidated with this video. Thanks for watching. I'll see you again in the next video.